the perfect rep range, scientifically proven to be better at everything. <laughs> that is not correct. Yeah, baby. Let's talk about reps, baby. Let's talk about you and me. Let's talk about all the dogma, all the dog shit reps can be. What's up, motivators? Welcome back. It's Kevin, and this is Pure Bullfit. Today, we are going to be talking about the magic, the majesty, the perfection of five rep sets. But before we get into any of that, I do want to cover something really quick. Looking around the fitness industry, health and wellness associated arenas like body positivity, fat acceptance, intuitive eating, all of the things and the people that we talk about, things have gotten a little bit out of hand. Now, I recently started a podcast and my very first episode is fitness community, uh, specifically the online fitness community, taking more accountability for how we've contributed to the aggressively hostile environment that we're currently in. Now, that might sound weird coming from somebody who has a channel that is at least 50% callouts, but there is a stark difference between a content creator and a public figure calling out another content creator who is a public figure. And what is currently happening, which is members of our community and their communities are harassing each other, bullying each other, threatening each other. Now, this is, that's a problem. I don't agree with that kind of behavior. I don't think that anybody should be afraid to express their opinion. Have you noticed that our caps have actually got little pictures of skulls on them? <laughs> I don't, so... Hans, are we the baddies? <laughs> Okay, maybe those guys should be afraid to express their opinion in public, but that's not really what we're talking about. So I'm going to be abundantly clear to the members of my community. If you follow me and I call somebody out, I do not want you to go to their page, their business, and threaten them, harass them, give them a hard time. You are free as a free person in a free society to express your individual opinion, but I highly encourage you to draw the line short of harassment and bullying. And definitely don't do it with my words and definitely don't do it in the name of the pure bullfit community. This isn't about liability, it's about right and wrong. And I do believe that content creators to an extent are responsible for the consequences of the content that they create. So I think that this is the appropriate course of action to take. I'm telling you flatly, do not harass people, do not bully people, and definitely do not threaten people because if that's the kind of person that you are, you do not belong in this community. And if that makes you think that I'm some sort of soft snowflake social justice warrior, well, I'd rather be that than some spineless coward hiding behind a computer screen. So, with that out of the way, let's go ahead and get to the topic at hand. The magic, the majesty, the perfection, the dogma, and the dog shit of five rep sets. Now, before I need to go get a cold weather beanie, a sleeveless shirt, and a shovel to make my point, let me flatly say, there's nothing wrong with five rep sets. Five reps is useful in programming for novices, for intermediate, and for advanced lifters. It has its place and it has its scope. What we're talking about today is what the community and some professionals have done with it. We've turned it from this very useful tool in our toolbox to the toolbox. And I think that's where we've gone too far. So what we're going to try and do today in this video is to strip away the nonsense, reinsert the context, and give you a proper scope for where five reps might work into your programming if it's appropriate for you, and kind of deal with some of the problematic statements that some very prominent figures out there have been saying on the subject. It is no mystery to anyone who's been lifting for any amount of time that five rep sets feature prominently in a number of very famous, widely and ubiquitous programs. Strong lifts, uh, starting strength. Wendler's 531. We even incorporated five rep sets into our training program at East Coast West Coast Strength and Conditioning in strongman style training. It definitely has its place. Its focus is force production. And force production is just one of the things that we're going to talk about today. We're also going to talk about hypertrophy, muscle endurance, balance, neuromuscular efficiency, proprioception, skill learning, and moving a joint through its full range of motion, and reinsert as much context as possible so that you can use this training concept appropriately and responsibly. So why is five reps, particularly five by five, so prominent in so many programs like starting strength and strong lifts? Because it works. See, for a novice or even an intermediate, someone who is unaccustomed to more complex training paradigms or the levels of volume that are included in other kinds of programs, 5x5 five five is a perfectly appropriate, high enough intensity, compound movement-based program for you to make significant progress on. 
particularly for a novice. Now, I don't necessarily mean an absolute noob, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later in the video. But there's no doubt that it can be effective, and the guys at Starting Strength will waste absolutely no time letting you know just that. Now, most of the professionals who talk about these training paradigms are pretty responsible with the information that they put out there. They carefully tailor their language to let you know that they're talking predominantly about novice lifters and they're talking about force production. But this is where the dogma starts to creep in. We'll start with an analogy, and for the purposes of this video, we are going to talk about a rep range between 1, the least number of reps you can do, and 20, the most number of reps that you can do. Why? Because that's the analogy that starting strength uses over and over again. Why an upper limit of 20 reps? Because they consistently, in their analogy, make the argument that anything after that is really not worth talking about. That the adaption that you would make, that the results that you would get from 21 to 22, 23 to 24, so on and so forth, is so small, it's not worth talking about. And I don't necessarily agree with that. But between reps 1 and 20, we can cover all the major topics that I do want to discuss in how to implement five reps, its place and its proper scope. Things like neuromuscular efficiency, proprioception, force production, muscle endurance, joint balance, range of motion, safety, and risk. If you want to hear the analogy uninterrupted by my commentary from start to finish, I've included that in a link below so you can hear it for yourself. I've also got clips that I'll be using from a video from Mark Ripito. I have included his entire video from his radio podcast below as well. I will be taking from it and talking about certain segments that I find relevant to this conversation, but the entire thing is there for you to listen to and come to your own conclusions. The gist of the analogy is that adaptions exist across this spectrum of repetitions. That at one end, one rep is predominantly and almost exclusively for force production, that almost no hypertrophy or muscle endurance is going to be gained at that level of repetition, and that at 20, muscle endurance and hypertrophy is about all you're going to get at that end. Now, I, I disagree. There's also proprioception, neuromuscular efficiency, there's joint health, being able to move through a range of motion, uh, mitigating risk when you incorporate higher weights, but we'll talk about that in a minute when I talk about Mark Ripito and his controversial and problematic statements. They bait you into saying, what's the middle ground? 10 reps. And then they explain that that's not the case because too much fatigue occurs. Also, we'll talk about that in a little bit. That five reps is actually ideal because it involves enough intensity that you can stimulate all of the requisite fibers, that you will also gain hypertrophy effects, and that you will also gain muscle endurance effects. I think that's a really ballsy claim. And they justify this position by saying that they have thousands upon thousands of data points that support it. And those data points are simply people who have used the program and claimed that they made progress. But that's problematic, and here's why. A novice, a real novice, with any level of activity increase, any level of controlling their diet, is going to make progress pretty much anything that they do. You can argue that push-ups is not a great way to develop strength in your chest because you believe the bench press is the ideal way to do that. But if you're someone who is deconditioned and has no experience really doing either, you're going to get a stronger chest when you do push-ups because that is an increase in the demands that you've put on your body. Furthermore, for every one person I can think of who has made good, solid progress on a 5x5 five five program using exclusively or predominantly five reps, I can think of five more that have made no progress, stalled, and didn't get anywhere because they try to incorporate this programming outside of the context for which it's appropriate. Don't be confused. Five reps is extremely valuable for training force production with some small amount of hypertrophy, perhaps a little muscular endurance, and precious little metabolic conditioning. It's a novice program for a reason. You're not ready for more. Now, that's not a dig, and it's not an insult, and it's not anything that you should be ashamed of. But realize that not everybody's goals are the same. So what are the useful elements that we're talking about here? In the context of this conversation, force production is your ability to produce force through a range of motion, to move weight from point A to point B as quickly as possible with as much force as possible. Neuromuscular efficiency is how well your body recruits your muscle fibers to perform the task at hand, how well trained it is to do that, how many motor neurons it recruits, how many muscle fibers it recruits in order to accomplish the task at hand. And that is a skill, that is a capacity that needs to be developed. It doesn't start at its maximum capacity. What's balance? Your ability to hold position and structure through a range of motion. 
What's hypertrophy? The increase in the size of cross-sectional area of muscle tissue how big and round it is. Now that does typically come with some amount of strength gain, but the focus is the size and fullness. What's muscular endurance? How many times, how much repetition can a muscle endure through a range of motion with a given weight in a given time period? Those are the factors that can change. Those are the things that we're training when we're talking about this rep range of one to 20, this arbitrary rep range of one to 20. Right off the bat, I want to apologize for the quality of the audio here. I've misplaced the cable for my microphone, so for these clips, I'm actually just using the camera's microphone. So where you fall in the rep range largely determines its overall effect on your body. Towards the top, towards 20 reps, it's mostly muscular endurance with a little bit of hypertrophy. So your muscles will get a little bit bigger and they will get better at processing the waste products and performing a larger work capacity in a given amount of time with a given weight. As you increase the weight and decrease the volume or decrease the number of reps, you are working on still hypertrophy, but more neuromuscular efficiency, your body's ability to recruit motor neurons, to activate muscle fibers, to continue to push, and towards strength, power production, the ability to produce force through a range of motion. This is a broad spectrum of needs that your body is trying to address. And simply confining all of that to a five rep set, which is much closer to the force production end of the scale than it is the muscle endurance is problematic. Balance is necessary. Training your moment arms, your arms and your legs to be able to work through an entire range of motion safely requires a spectrum of effort. You should start with lighter weight and higher volume to train your body how to do that and slowly increase that weight and decrease the volume so that you can handle heavier and heavier weights and learn to handle heavier and heavier weights. That is a perfectly safe and totally advisable way to approach strength training. If your goal even is pure strength, you don't necessarily need to start with five rep sets as is suggested in starting strength or strong lifts or any of the other five by five programs. And keep in mind, it's not just the major muscle groups that we're working here. We also have our synergistic and stabilizing muscles, the connective tissue, our ligaments and our tendons to consider. They may not be as prepared for heavier loads as your major muscles like your quads and your lats and your chest is. You have to consider those things, those skills, those tolerances and the endurance must be built there as well. You'll have better balance if you take a higher volume, lighter weight at first approach, or if you even just incorporate it in with some heavier work. But limiting yourself to a primarily force production scope for your rep range is selling yourself short on all of the other capacities that you will need to have a strong and fit body. Look, pure strength is nice and it's absolutely a legitimate goal, but it's not everything and it can't solve all your problems. In recent decades with the rise in popularity of strength sports like strongman and powerlifting, we've seen an increase in the desire for people to train towards that capacity, a increased focus on force production over what used to be hypertrophy. It used to be get your beach bod, and there's still a massive portion of the population that is concerned with that. But more and more people are now concerned with the amount of weight that's on the bar. Therefore, we have more and more training styles that are conducive to that end. But that's where things get messed up. See, 20 years ago, I can remember how three sets of 10 was the dogma. That has been handily disproven as the only effective way to train. And I think it's really fair to say the same thing about five by five. As I mentioned before, most of the professionals who talk about this, who talk about using predominantly five rep sets, do so responsibly, do so in the context of strength training for a slight mix of force production, hypertrophy, muscle endurance, metabolic conditioning, neuromuscular efficiency, that mind-muscle connection, what, so on and so forth. It's mostly us who removes the context from the situation and presents what worked for us in a short period of time to others as the way to work out. And it's us who needs to be more responsible. It's your gym buddy who's telling you that he's been doing five by five for six months and he's seen 100 pounds on his bench press. Now that 100 pounds is 135 to 235 pounds, and he weighs 195 pounds. So these are this is a bit of context that's kind of important. The fact of the matter is, guys, there is no perfect rep range to accomplish all of these goals. There is a rep range that is most appropriate towards your goals, and that is what you should incorporate predominantly in your training. 
I don't even believe that you should exclusively use a rep range, that you should incorporate a mix of them because all of the capacities that we talked about, hypertrophy, muscle endurance, lactic threshold, which you haven't even mentioned yet, your neuromuscular efficiency, balance, muscular endurance, all of them are important for a healthy and fit body. You can hyperfocus on force production and strength, but that's not health. So why am I bringing health into this? Well, I didn't do it first. That was Mark Ripito. Now, this is where I stand to get into the most trouble with the largest number of people, because Mark Ripito is a very polarizing figure. He's one of those people that you either love or hate, generally speaking. That you either automatically accept what he has to say based off of his three decades of experience in the strength training industry, or you tend to focus on the handful of completely unsubstantiated, indefensible, ridiculous, controversial comments that he's made, and anything he has to say automatically gets filtered through that several layers of bullshit. It's a hard middle ground to find, and I don't think that I occupy the middle ground. I think that I have a tendency to disregard what Mark has to say because of the idiot things he said. And I just think that there are more reasonable, more level-headed individuals who are not caught up in their own dogma so much, who stand a better chance of legitimately helping you implement a program like Starting Strength. Folks like Alan Thrall. He's got a great video on how to approach Starting Strength. I've linked that one below as well. But back to Mark. He is a large part of the problem why this dogma exists. It couldn't simply exist with a bunch of bro-hard or bro-home types in the gym saying, Five reps is the best, dude! Anything over five reps is cardio, man. And all of the other nonsense that you hear around this topic. Guys like that are one thing, but when the godfather of a training system is out there saying controversial, unquantifiable, irresponsible, and possibly dangerous statements about the efficacy of their program and where it fits into training in general, that's just throwing gasoline on a dogmatic dogshit fire. Now, I am not calling into question the efficacy of 5x5 programs. They are exceptionally appropriate for people with strength-related goals, particularly novices. What I am calling into question is a lot of the conversation surrounding it that misrepresents its scope and its place in that training. Point in case, we have this video here where Mark complains that the medical community overprescribes high-volume, low-weight resistance training and undervalues high intensity or high weight and lower volume work to achieve the same goals, whereas he thinks the latter is more appropriate. Actually, that was a super reasonable way to describe what Mark said. He basically acts like the medical community is unqualified to weigh in on the subject and that his way is, if not the only way, the best way. And it's that kind of nonsense coming from the creator of a successful and ubiquitous program weighing in in such a de facto way that doesn't leave any room for nuance or context that drives this behavior. That's why we have people who are walking around the gym doing their 5x5 five five, wondering why they're not making any progress and they haven't been launched into the stratosphere of weightlifting and strength sports success. It's important to note that in this analogy, we're not talking about strength athletes. We're not talking about power lifters. We're not talking about people who are trying to train with specificity. This analogy that he put together is about a person, an aging person, going to the doctor thinking about incorporating resistance training into their exercise regime because they've heard it's a good thing. So for the purpose of this example, we already know we're dealing with somebody who is an extreme novice. They have very little experience in the gym. This is his analogy. So that's the parameters that we're going to hold him responsible to. If you ask about strength training, since you've heard that it was a good idea and you know that walking is not strength training, well, their advice will be to just lift lighter weights and do more reps. Lighter weights and higher reps. That's the ticket, right? If we have a novice who has very little, if no experience whatsoever with resistance training, and they are not specifically a strength athlete, they're not looking to be a powerlifting competitor or strongman or something like that, why are we postulating that five reps is the most appropriate rep range for them to be working in because it has the greatest strength adaptation? So Mark here makes the case that 10 reps would sound reasonable except fatigue sets in and therefore form breaks down and that's where risk is introduced. Well, that seems like a reasonable argument at first. As fatigue sets in, form does break down and that does increase risk. And if risk is the primary reason that doctors are recommending a higher volume, lower weight paradigm to approach resistance training, it sounds like you have a point. Except you don't really, because what you're talking about doing is using a higher intensity, higher weight 
therefore more risk with the same level of proficiency. That's the major issue. If you're using somewhere around 80, 85% of your potential, I don't want to say one rep max because I don't recommend that novices determine what their one rep max is. But if you use a weight that is very challenging for five reps, which it would need to be challenging in order to incite adaption, you're still going to fatigue. You're going to get tired towards the end of that set or seven reps or 10 reps or 15 reps or 20 reps. So let me ask you a question. What is safer to be fatigued under? 80% of what you're capable of, 70% of what you're capable of, 55% of what you're capable of. Where do you stand for the most to go wrong when fatigue sets in and your form breaks down? Particularly when you're a novice and don't have a lot of experience getting out from under a bar. Perhaps you weren't smart enough to ask for a spotter. Perhaps you don't know what you're doing because all you did was buy a starting strength book and try and follow the directions exactly. When it comes down to it, I simply disagree that you can make up for other capacities through force production. That through increased capacity and force production, you can make up for hypertrophy, balance, muscle control through mind-muscle connection or neuromuscular efficiency, joint strength. You can't just develop these things through force production alone. Later in the video, Mark expresses his opinion that you can see too many of the other needs of your muscle tissue, such as hypertrophy, balance, neuromuscular efficiency, uh, so on and so forth, through focusing on force production. He states that if you are stronger, you're capable of doing a lighter weight many more times. It sees to that need. And to a very limited extent, that can be true. If you can bench press 300 pounds, chances are you can do a fair number of push-ups. If you train for push-ups, and cannot bench 300 pounds, you are still going to be able to do more push-ups than the guy who can bench press 300 pounds. Specificity is king in training, and that really needs to be taken into account when we're talking about the generation of force production, the training of the capacity of force production. Just because you're strong doesn't mean you're automatically going to be better at all the things that you need to be better at. And it is a very narrow mindset that believes, thinks, and promotes the idea that Focusing on force production is the key to seeing to all of those needs. Particularly, in his analogy, when we're talking about people of very low experience who may be aging, joint health is a legitimate issue. You can't apply a one-size-fits-all, and there is no one-size-fits-all solution to all of the needs that we have in regards to our health, wellness, and fitness. Some of us want to get stronger, Mark. Cool. Starting strength might be for them, particularly if they're novice. However, the average person walking into the doctor's office isn't going to set themselves back by taking the advice of starting out with higher volume and lower weight. They can develop joint health through its full range of motion, capacity towards the movements through neuromuscular efficiency and proprioception, muscle endurance, and familiarity with the movements so that they know when things are going wrong, so that they can make that higher intensity work that I agree they should incorporate much safer when they do perform it. But taking somebody with a very low training experience level, putting them under a bar with ostensibly 80, 85, 87% of what they are capable of moving once, asking them to do it five times, is inviting risk. The very risk you claim you're trying to avoid and fix that the medical community simply misunderstands how to do it. My biggest problem with the advice that he gives and the arguments that he makes is that he seems to be of the opinion that if everything goes right, then nothing can go wrong, and therefore, there is no risk. What the hell do I mean by that? The pictures on the screen are excerpts from an article that he wrote on safety in the squat, risks to the back, and shearing forces on the lumbar spine. In it, he opines that effectively, there's no such thing as shearing forces on the spine. Now, shearing force is when force is applied, to an object in opposite directions. And in this article, he describes it as one segment sliding past another. The first problem is, in his picture, he represents the spine as like an iron bar, when in fact it's a very complicated structure involving vertebrate, muscle, ligaments, tendons, your spinal cord, disc tissue. Not a rigid bar that doesn't move. His picture is disingenuous because he demonstrates where he feels the force is applied, the moment arms, how they're going to move, as if the rest of it was an immovable, unaffectable element. And that's just not the case. In the absence of anything going wrong, I'm sure that his cue advice and his position would be adequate and valid. But that's not how our bodies work. 
I don't think I've ever seen a perfect rep. Near perfect, sure, it wasn't mine, but they don't really exist. There's always something going on in the body, a compensation, a shift, a movement. We use soft tissue to apply force to very solid things. Is your one glute firing harder than the other? If so, that will create a rotational force in your hips, in your torso, in the relation between the two. That would be a shearing force on the spine. Are your spinal erectors not up to the task to the weight that you've decided that you're going to lift? That will create rounding. And at that point, shearing forces can affect your spine. Are there muscle imbalances because you use different grips or you're using a weight that you're unaccustomed to or a bar width that you're unaccustomed to? Is the weight evenly balanced? Is your grip balanced? There are so many factors that go into whether or not a rep is perfectly executed that you cannot in any amount of confidence say that there are no rotational or opposite forces being applied to your spinal column. There are shearing forces. With all of that in mind, I think it's fair to say that there is some amount of force, shearing or otherwise, on every rep of every compound movement. And it introduces an amount of risk that has to be compensated for through good form and technique. That's where this problem comes in. You see, when you pretend that a significant issue doesn't exist at all because it suits your cues, your methodology, and your paradigm, you are needlessly putting people at risk. Things like cues like nipples to the floor during the squat. Can you complete a repetition from that position? Absolutely, an aggressive forward lean. People do it all the time. Can you lift a lot of weight that way? Sure. Is there no risk no added risk because there's no such thing as shearing forces on a lumbar spine. Absolutely not. That is not true at all. And I don't think you have to do much more than take a look at the people who consistently squat in this manner for a long period of time, people like Mark Ripito, and see how they cross the room from point A to point B. Tess Holliday is not the only person having trouble getting up the stairs these days. Now, some of you might have thought that that was a needless dig, but I am trying to point out that you have to be careful the quality and caliber of the advice that you take. Regardless of who it's coming from, you have to quantify it and evaluate it because it is factually incorrect that there is no such thing as shearing forces on the spot. And by needlessly perpetuating the mindset that as long as everything goes right, nothing can go wrong, therefore there is no risk, we are needlessly putting the novices we say we're serving at risk. We're putting them in danger for no damn reason other than our foolish pride. Those ideas, those kinds of statements are the things that add fuel to the fire to this dogma, to this idea that there is one way to train. There isn't, because there isn't one goal, there isn't one starting point. Fitness, strength training, health and wellness is an individual pursuit where we can look to others for guidelines, for mile markers, and it is a constant exercise in reevaluating where we are, what we're doing, and what our goals are in order to achieve them. We can't simply apply a one-size-fits-all solution because there is no such thing. And treating any program like it's the end-all, be-all, five-by-five or otherwise, as if it is the answer to all of your fitness questions, is kind of like asking for directions to Las Vegas and being told how to get to Las Cruces. Sure, depending on where you're starting from, it might be on the way, but no matter which way you slice it, it's not where you were trying to be. At the end of the day, are five rep sets effective? Strong lifts, starting strength, Wendler's 531, or any of the other programs that use them? Absolutely, yes. They are perfectly suited towards their role and their scope. But they shouldn't be conflated with a one-size-fits-all solution to all of your training needs. Approaching training from that angle is only gonna end in disappointment and impaired motor function. Remember guys, the fitness industry is a cesspool of misinformation. And be wary of the folks who tell you there's only one real goal and only one way to get there. Your starting point, your actual true goal, and your needs, your experience level, all determine what is most appropriate for you. All right guys, that's it, that's the video for today. Those are my thoughts on five rep sets, where they might fit into your training, their appropriate scope, and my thoughts on the dogmatic dog shit surrounding the conversation. I look forward to seeing you guys in the next video. If you liked what I had to say, go ahead and let me know. Smash that like button. If you didn't, go ahead and hit dislike. Either way, comment below. If you want to see more of this content and you're not subscribed, you already know what to do. And while you're at it, go ahead and hit that notification bell so you can get notified every time I upload a new video, which I keep saying is going to be more than once a week, but so far is basically once a week. But you can pretty much rely on once a week 
which is more than Don Mazzetti can say. Let's talk about reps, baby. Let's talk about you and me. Let's talk about all the... Oh, shit, this is still on.